Hello all, viewers at home. Um, good afternoon. Today is another day. First of all, happy Mother's Day. And uh, for today's program, we are still on poverty virus in Nigeria. And today we are going to be talking basically on what's the fit of research and development in Nigeria. And we have one of our own um, from a graduate of Modibo Adama University of Technology, the best graduating in, a student from the School of Engineering, and the Cadet Corrent National Best Engineering Graduate Awardee, second place in Nigeria, and currently a scholar with solution providers at uh, Nottingham University, England, studying MSc in, um, in electrical engineering. And he's no other person than Gift Ogaba Udo. He will be talking to us basically from experience. He will tell us the research he did during his undergraduates. And he will give us the fate of research and development in Nigeria. If you are here with me on Facebook, you can also send your questions. He is going to entertain your questions. I remain my humble self, as usual, your loyal boy, Papka International, the one that have roots in Africa, branches in North and South America, Asia, Australia, Antarctica, and Europe. Today, we are going to take it to the, to the Ministry of Science and Technology in Nigeria. So, Engineer Gift Ogaba Udo, yeah. I bless the womb that brought you to this world tonight. Amen, thanks. Um, and it is a wonderful womb. And today is Mother's Day. Mm. So we are privileged to have you. Uh, to talk to us, you will tell Nigerians the research, your projects you have done during your undergraduate days. What is it all about? Areas that need improvement, and the government is not looking into it. So it's over to you at the moment. Thank right. you, sir. Yes. OK. Uh... Thank you for having me, Mr. Pius. Um, as you rightly said, my name is Gift. Uh, and um, I just want to like correct some of the intros. So, I mean, just to set it straight, I am doing my MSc in the, um, at the Department of Electrical and Electronic Engineering at the University of Nottingham under the Developing Solutions Master Scholarship. Yeah, okay, okay, that was okay. the name you're looking for, Developing Solutions Master Scholarship. So, Thank you. Yeah. I started my program in September 2020, and it will run to, uh, I might take until 21st of September 2021. Yeah. So um, I am here to speak majorly on my undergraduate project, my uh, you know final year project to be particular. Um, basically, I will run through why I ended up with the project and then you know what I did and you know perceptions of um, how that would have contributed to the body of knowledge you know from my own perspective as i you know have rightly said so um i would love to share my screen just to be able to further illustrate uh, my points i think it'll be better that way so i'll go on to share my screen now yeah Is my screen live? Yes. All right, great. OK. So right, um, my undergraduate project um, was on working guide shoe for visually impaired persons. Um, yeah, my name is Gift Odo, and that's my LinkedIn um, URL. Um, so I did my undergraduate um, from the Modibo Adama University of Technology, Yola, formerly known as Federal University of Technology, Yola. 
and um, you know, great university, to be very honest. So much challenges, but I think it was worth it. Um, so before I ended up with that topic, um, for us a project and top um, project topic, yes, I actually had a bit of uh, an experience. I think it would be nice to share. So before my project, I was trying so hard to dodge um, any form of um, work that would involve me, you know, doing code, uh, writing codes, and um, you know, implementing microprocessors, microcontrollers, and so on because I didn't feel like I wanted to dive into that. I wanted to be more hands-on in my projects, you know, more or less like design systems, you know, physical systems that I can directly connect to interact with each other to, you know, achieve an aim. So I first submitted my project topic uh, as, um, you know, wireless charging device for electronics. So when I did that, the project coordinator got back to me and said, no, he can't allow me to do that topic because um, Kida, he said um, someone has done it before, or one of my mates was to do it. And it's like a first come, first serve. So uh, that topic wasn't available to me in that sense. Well, that was disappointing because uh, I felt okay if I was to work on a wireless device, you know, there's more or less uh, uh, nothing to do with coding. I just need to work on um, electromagnetism and all that to transfer energy from one circuit to another. So, hmm, so I had to think hard that day. And unfortunately for me, I think that was the last day to um, 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 to have my topic allocated and assigned. So I was under a little bit of pressure, uh, and uh, the supervisor, sorry, the coordinator, um, requested that okay that they have a bunch of load of topics that if I don't have any in my mind, that he's willing to just give me any so that I could use um, as my topic. But I didn't want that because first of all, that was a big gamble. What if he gives me a topic that would not interest me or, you know, that might not be relevant to my interest. So I stepped out of his office for a while, had a bit of rethink, and then I returned into his office and I told him, okay, I have a topic now. And then I gave him the name, I told him I want to design shoes for visually impaired persons. And he was like, wait, you want to make shoes for the blind? I said, yeah, yeah. I mean, I thought about it. I have not seen anything like that. And I wanted my work to be a little ingenious. You know, so I was like, yeah, that's a very good idea. So he approved it. And then that was how I ended up with that topic. But the reason I actually went for the topic, in the, uh, that is for the second topic anyway, was that within that period when I was um, outside this office thinking and, you know, trying to come up with a topic, I remember the, an incident I had with one of my cousins who lost his sight uh, to glaucoma uh, at an early age, you know, just, I think he's just a few years up, um, older than me. So after losing his sight, you know, it was a very disastrous moment for him because technically his life ended. You know, he was confined into his room for like a year or two, just in his room, coming out just to um, like him receive fresh air and then he wanted to return to the village and all that. So I had the opportunity of um, interacting with him before he passed on because he later died from the incident. It was so difficult. And then I was really watching him, how he was struggling to navigate around the house or the village. He had a house then in the village. So, and then I thought, okay, why don't we have a device to help people like him, you know, navigate safely or even more seamlessly instead of the walking stick that they use, which is kind of crude. So that was why I thought, okay, I'm going to make a shoe. And at that instant, the only idea I had about the shoe was that, okay, I was using in, um, ultrasonic sensors. <laughs> and that was it. I didn't know any, what else that, you know, would, uh, would it would require. It was just like, all right, let me just try it as an adventure. Well, submitted so the topic and of course, and the man was happy to approve it because he was like, wow, that's an interesting topic and you would like to see how it goes. And that was how I started with, um, I started my uh, final year project, you know, from that angle of uh, designing a working guide shoe. Unfortunately for me now, this time around, it will require microprocessing, or oh, sorry, microprocessors as the case may be, because you have to compute some um, sensors and uh, interface them, you know to be able to um, achieve your aim. So anyway, that was it. And then I started my work. So I will start by defining the concept, just a general overview of the concept and you know the basic working idea. So when people work, you observe that in a working cycle of humans, they, assign, they assume at least um, three motions, three unique motions. The reason I, I sorry, four unique motions, not, uh, yeah. So humans assume these four unique motions when they work. 
although here we have five pictures, but the fifth one is more or less like the same thing as the first one. So it's just to complete the circle. The first and the last are the same. However, the first, second, third, and fourth are different. So when people walk, they assign, as in generally, people assume these motions. And then I thought, okay, if I'm to use this motion, what can I do? So I thought, all right, the furthest distance away from your body when you walk is from your foot. Yeah, because if you notice from the first picture, the foot for most people is swinged further than the arm. So I thought, okay, at least that is the um, that is the part of the body most likely to hit the target that is in the front. Although, of course, if you can walk, you can hit other um, obstacles, you know, above the nail level and the, yeah, the nail level and all that. But I thought, okay, it's undergraduate project. I need to keep it real and simple. So I thought, okay, I'm going to make a shoe for the blind people. And then I was lucky to have said walking shoe because obviously from the picture, I realized that um, the furthest um, part of the body from uh, the human, that is when you walk, <laughs> is your foot. All right, so I thought, okay, so if I have a sensor, uh, how do I incorporate it? And then I realized the general type of obstacles you might come across when you walk is either you hit something or you fall into something. So I thought, okay, then I have to somehow detect obstacles in form of solid objects on the part of motion, and at the same time, depressions on the part of motion that might more or less uh, be you know, assumed to be holes. Because if you're walking blindly or maybe you're visually impaired, your vision is not very clear, and then you walk, there's high possibility that if the depression is not very level, that, sorry, if your walk part is not very leveled or, you know, slightly undulated, and then if the variations are too much, if you come across a very deep steep, you might, um, you might stumble. So I thought, okay, I think I could work with that. And then that was how I started. So I thought, all right, um, in the third picture, you realize that um, the highest height from the foot to the ground is obtained there. And um, from the first picture, you get the highest length of obstacle from the foot. So I, I decided to use the concept of the first motion and the third motion to design the shoe. Obviously, the second one has more actions as uh, for the back foot. Yeah, and the fourth picture is more or less balancing the two foots together before you as, um, assume the next walk cycle. So that's what I did. I decided to adopt it. So yeah, I thought, OK, so I would use ultrasonic sensors to um, design a working guy's shoe for visually impaired persons. And what I decided to do was to have two of it, one in the front of the shoe and one in the bottom of the shoe. OK, so I've said ultrasonic sensors a number of times. An ultrasonic sensor is just a sensor that works like a sonar. And what it does is that it uses um, sound, although in this case, we call it ultrasonic sound because it uses high frequency sounds, not the audible range, not the one we can hear. Bats, for instance, speak within this range of ultrasound. So bats actually emit sonars. Those that we don't hear it because they're high frequency. And our audible range, I think, is between um, um, 4 kilohertz to 20 kilohertz, I think, something like that. Meanwhile, the ultrasonic sensor works around 40 kilohertz range of um, audio frequency. So the ultrasonic sensor works by sending sound out and then reading the time it takes for the sound to be reflected back from an object. So by measuring the time taken for the sound to travel, you calculate distance of objects. And then that's how it works. So, but the particular basic principle of the ultrasonic sensor itself, this is how it works. So it uses the principle of time of flight, as I said earlier. But what it does is that um, an ultrasonic sensor has two um, obvious um, uh, actuators or something like that here. Yeah. So it has one that emits the sound, a piezoelectric device that emits the ultrasound. And then it has a second one that um, records the um, that records the sound when it's bounced back. So what it does is that the two of them will come on at the same time. We call it high in the programming language. You say so the two of them will come high. That is the turn on. So the first one will send the ultrasound, and then when the sound bounces back, the second one will turn off. So obviously, by measuring the time it takes for the second one to be on then you can calculate the time it took for the ultrasound to travel from the shoe or from the sensor to the obstacle and back. 
So when you do that, you know, using um, distance over time measurement of speed, uh, obviously speed of sound is 343, uh, 343 meters per second. And then let's say you have an obstacle of um, one meter away, so it will take two meters in distance. And obviously time is roughly around 3.8 milliseconds. Anyway, not to go too deep into the concepts, but I believe um, people can establish, you know, what I'm talking about. So I decided to uh, design my project in this setting. So this is what I did. These are the two ultrasonic sensors, one for the front, one for the back. And then this is what we call, sorry, can you see my mounts? I can hear you. Yes, mute. yes. Okay, my mouse is visible, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay, I'll use my mouse as a pointer. So these are ultrasonic sensors. And then actually they're called HCSR04, or the um, ultrasonic sensor modules. So yeah, one emits the ultrasound, the second one um, measures the, or let's say senses the bounce or the code or the ultrasound. And obviously, as I said, they will turn on at the same time. And then while, sorry, um, they turn on at the same time. And then when this one sends the sound, this one will be on and then wait for the sound to bounce back. And then when the sound is received, it goes off. So by measuring the time it took for this to be on, then you can do your manipulations and get the distance of an object. So this is what controls the um, actions of the two ultrasonic sensors. And um, this is called my microprocessor. Um, so I use the, um, the I don't know the sensor again. I can't remember the specific name. It's been a while. I use them, but it's um, I forgot the name of the chip anyway. It's, it, I would have given you the exact name of this chip I use. But anyway, it's a microprocessor. And then, um, yeah, these are just the oscillatory unit to control the clocking and all that. Then um, in this case, in this place here, we have the power unit. So this is the um, the ultrasonic sensors and um, the microprocessor. This is because um, the ultrasonic sensors work on five volts. Even the microprocessor also works with five volts. However, the battery, this battery here is a very common battery, the types used in microphones. This is a 12 volt battery. So if you supply this battery to these devices, you will fry them up because um, that is high rating. So in other words, what this does is just to step down this five volts to uh, 12 volts battery to 12, five volts and supply the appropriate current to the devices here on the five volt scale. And then these are vibrating motors discs. These two stops here. Sorry, my this here. <laughs> All right. So these two black stops here are just vibrating uh, devices. Vibrating motors. They are very small. So um, again, the vibrating motor. Uh, um, you know, the I think there are three volts devices. Three volts. They, they work with three volts input. Obviously, this is five volts, so five volts to this would not really work. So somehow I stepped down part of it in around this place called the driver circuit. And then um, again, since it takes um, three volts or so, something like that, I think three volts or there about. And um, yeah, the outputs of this are not very strong. So driving these motors, you know, I had to like um, somehow like actuate the motors from the battery but in the sense that it only comes on if it receives an input from the microprocessor. So this controls the actions of the microprocessor, sorry, of the vibrating disks. So this is what we, in, as in technically what I designed here is a relay. So these are just relay circuits <laughs> for the disks because um, yeah, they allow higher voltages to be supplied to, or let's say higher currents to be supplied to an output, but controlled from a smaller supply. In, 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 if I'm explaining it in layman's term. That was it. And then I decided, okay, I did it, wrote my program. So it was what I was trying to avoid. I couldn't really avoid it again. I needed to learn how to code and all that. So I wrote my program, bond, and bond the program on the microprocessor, tested it. And surprisingly, on my first trial, it worked <laughs> perfectly. This. And this was the power supply this way. And there's a bulb here to indicate that it's on anyway. And um, yeah, so I got it to work. And I thank God for that. It was not easy because um, I hardly could find materials online. So I had to almost design every circuit from the scratch myself. 
Uh, most of the things I did there were the concepts that I had to think about myself, and then it was a very good time and uh, learning curve for me because I discovered so many things, you know, learning on my own and uh, designing the stuff um, by myself, which is um, a very good message to students who just love to go online and find materials for their project. Sometimes it's good to find something that no one has done. It will help you learn, you know, by the time you um, go through that challenging phase, you most likely, if you're motivated, you will come out of it one way or another. So that's what happened here. Now I got it to work, so tested it and it worked. And then I thought, all right, it's time to incorporate it in a shoe. Anyway, before I go further, I will explain that here. So I said it that this one of the digs, so one of the sensors is for the front, one is for the bottom. And obviously the distance of obstacle, or let's say the safe distance of obstacles based on research by, by an, an author, I discovered that um, 80 centimeters is a very good safe distance, you know, based on a particular material I read. So I set the front obstacle and uh, front sensor to um, to sense obstacle or to um, if an obstacle, I mean the controller here works in the sense that if although this measures the distance of obstacle, but from this controller, if the uh, distance is um, let's say 80 less than 80 centimeters, then um, um put your out um get one of the micro um vibrating motor digs high get it high in other words turn it on and then for the second one i discovered when people walk again from another research i saw um yeah 15 15 centimeters is the basic height that is the height of the foot on the floor when you walk on the ground you know it's usually 15 it depends on people anyway height and all that but mostly it's 15 on the average so i thought okay a safe distance would be 20 centimeters so if there's an obstacle greater than 20 centimeters that's if you're walking and the ground doesn't bounce back in 20, in about 20, 20 centimeter length then you be careful it's probably a depression and that depression could be a hole so stop or notify again so in other words this one works in the reverse this one detects obstacles that are closer than 20 um, 80 centimeter, while this one detects obstacles that are further away from 20 centimeter. If you understand the concept. So if an obstacle, which is obviously the floor, is greater than 20 centimeter away from the sensor, then actuate one of your micro uh, vibrating motor. So I set it, one was for the front, and then one was for the back. And so I had to distribute this in my shoe. So what I did was to get a shoe, and then um, I, yeah, so I got the power circuit since they con um, constitute most of the hard devices. So the battery is very hard. And luckily for me, this sole I got is a very hard sole. So it doesn't really compress. So I got this power, this thing, and then I fixed it into the sole. Had my sensors um, in the front and in the bottom. And this is the microprocessor. Um, I mean, I was still coupling my devices anyway. So I needed to shield this, the power circuit. Okay, and then this is... Um, this uh, transistor, it gets hot. So in, in shielding this, we need to somehow give it a bit of ventilation. So I set some holes out, you know, from it so that, you know, you can get a bit of aerations into it. And then obviously made a casing. There was a shell I made uh, to cover this. And I also made a shell for these two sensors too, so that regardless of your weight, you don't press down on them too hard. And then that's what I did. So I had the sensors, the power supply and the battery in the sole. Then I, sent the microprocessor to the side. And obviously these are the driver circuits. And then these are the vibrating discs, which are my um, vibrotactile feedback me mechanisms. So the front one here, where's my mouse? Yeah, the front one is to indicate that you have an obstacle in the front. And then um, the back vibrating motor discs, this one here is to indicate that the depression is, uh, um, you know, longer than um, or larger than um, 20 centimeters. So that could be a hole, you know, the signal warning. So when this vibrates, you should know that there's an obstacle. When you walk and this one vibrates, then know there's an obstacle very close to you. And if this one vibrates, know that just um, it's, a, it's, it's an indication that the distance between your shoe or your leg and the floor is kind of high. So it could be a hole. So take note. And that was it. And then, yeah, so this is the final design. You know, when I couple the shoe back, this is the switch to turn it on. There's a bulb in the front, I think. I, if I have another picture. Yeah, there's a, this is where the bulb is, so it turns on red. <laughs> Although it's, a, a blind person wouldn't know if it's on or off anyway. <laughs> so it's just for him to know how to turn off and turn on the switch here. 
And then, but this is just like, yeah, it's just for me, you know, for testing to have a bulb here to know that the device is working. Obviously for anybody that wants to troubleshoot. And these are the sensors. So this is my project. Yeah, and then the coupled project and all that. And um, ideally the project, I did it basically just to like initiate a research into um, working that shoe for visually impaired persons because I discovered there were um, no much devices like that. Not at all anyway, at the time I did my project. When I searched, I couldn't find any. So yeah, I did it. It was a little crude because, you know, this thing has, it raises a lot of questions, you know. For instance, the sensors could get, if you, you know, walk in a wet terrain, then you could um, get them soaked and then that would um, short circuit or, yeah, it would short circuit those um, sensors and all that. So anyway, but it's just a working concept and it works. It's a concept. So now when you want to develop it large scale, there are many things you can tweak. These sensors, you can get smaller ones or you can get um, what um, water resistant sensors, if they, are, they should. And then they are, they are water resistant microtrasonic sensors, all that. And maybe the smaller ones so that will make it less bulky. And then, um, yeah, you can also increase the range. And then maybe if you can make more devices to like, the, maybe the blind person or the impaired person can wear to also detect obstacles on height, um, let's say elbow level or head level and all that. You know, so there were just many ideas that were floating around this. So I decided that, okay, I should do that as a body of research or like an instigation for people to look into that area. And basically that was my project. I was lucky I got it working anyway. <laughs> it was quite uh, an exciting experience and then it did. So yeah, I did it and then again, because it was on my undergraduate project. So I did it, I scored very well on my undergraduates. I remember, yeah, I scored, yeah. But I don't know. It was kind of high. I mean, my transcript, my project scored very highly. So again, that was a very good aim. Now, uh, when we talk about research and development, now driving this whole project down to research and development in Nigeria, I know many people are thinking that, hey, this is a very good idea. Why didn't you commercialize it and all that? The truth is, my external supervisor had a one-on-one -on -one with me, you know, about the project because he was interested in it. He said, oh, "Wow, that is a very good project. That have I ever thought of, like, you know." manufacturing it on a large scale or getting it out, you know, getting my idea out, patenting it and all that. Then I told him, yeah, if I have the guidance to do that, it's not a bad idea at all. It's actually very good. As a matter of fact, we need more devices like this to, you know, solve real problems that we face in Nigeria rather than imported technologies that don't really match with our needs. So at least if we can, if I do this and other people come up with ideas of devices that solve direct problems we encounter, you know, that would be a way of improving our own problem um, or solving our own problems by ourselves, which will be some, which, which will be faster and more efficient because um, at least there and then we're tackling direct issues. You know, this has compounded um, um, implications in the sense that visually impaired persons sometimes they are not just dependent on we um, on properly sighted people. Also, they could be a burden to the society. Sometimes on the road they are lying around, laying out and begging for arms, and then traffic congestions, you know, in such areas, child trafficking, because most of them, they use cane and they use kids to direct them around. So all those kids, you know, in the process of directing them around, working or showing them around, they don't go to school. You know, so many challenges are there that this, something like this could solve if it was, um, um, if it was commercialized or if it had the attention of uh, uh, the government in quotes. So, yeah, I, well, we had that conversation and that was it. It ended there. <laughs> I didn't hear anything back from anyone. Not that I'm complaining, but it was fine. At least I did it and it was my research. And then again, it was for my undergraduate project. So it's still fine. I achieved the main aim, but I felt like that shouldn't have been the end. You know, it should have been able, I, sh I should have had an avenue to, you know, develop further and, um, you know, do more or be given the opportunity to do more with other like minds. So that didn't come up. And to be very honest, like um, from my experience, I know that um, yeah, it is yeah the government they're trying you know to give a little bit of attention to science and technology, but we all know that's not their priority area. So the allocation, if you compare the percentage of what they give science and technology, is, well, in pure numbers is good, but in percentage ratio, you know, to other um, allocations or other um, aspects of the economy. You know, it's nothing. So, and then we also have this issue where in universities, a lot of our researchers, you know, professors, doctors, and all that, 
you know, they have ideas. They want to be able to work things out. But again, you have an idea, you apply for research, you apply for grants, you don't get any attention, you don't get anything from the university. And even when it comes, it comes in a very slight amount. And then what can you do with such amount? Nothing, really, if you really check it out. Research is very expensive. Um, so sometimes it feels as, as if they don't really care. They just want you to do these things because you should do it. But it's not like they're doing it because they need you to do it. And now we maybe we can um, tap into your idea and you know use it to solve real problems in the society. You know? Sometimes the way they do things, I just wonder if they really care much about solving our own, solving the problems um, we have in the country rather than just ensuring that things are done just because things have to be done to a particular standard. So I think the government um, needs to improve on that. Universities too, again, if, if the universities don't have the money, so what can they do? They need attention. I mean, private sector too should be able to fund uh, our universities, you know, fund researchers. That's what happens in developed countries. It's not really the government funding most research. Private sectors fund research because sometimes the solutions to um, the, the results of this research are used by some of these companies to improve their products or service delivery. So yeah, you spend a lot of money, they give them money, they do the research, they give them the results and then they improve and then they excel higher. And that's how to drive technology as a matter of fact. You know, money drives technology. You can't do anything without the money. Yeah, you can have an idea, but even if you have an idea and then the best you do without money is to simulate it online or simulate it, sorry, with um, simulate it on a computer. If you simulate it on a computer, that is an ideal. Most of these simulating environments are ideal, um, ideal conditions. In the real world, when you implement them, they may not work. Or if they work, they may have some challenges that you wouldn't have been able to notice with simulations, computer simulation. So sometimes you really need the materials, you need money to be able to build your concepts and then test them, test their viability in a practical sense so that you could tell how viable they are and what you should improve on or you know what is irrelevant or what or maybe a possible angle you should have um, um, exploited you know in um, in uh, developing your design so i've been talking for a while now i think basically that's it to be honest we okay. just need more attention and then um, honestly, we keep saying we need attention but the attention is not coming so sometimes rather than depending on the government i think it's time that nigeria um, nigeria doesn't depend much on the government because the government to be very honest in loose terms are not serious about they are serious but not serious enough to a very visible um condition in my if I, if I put it that way you know at the you know at the expense of um a very good way of putting it <laughs> anyway so if they could um if somehow research can be focused more uh, uh or targeted by private sectors companies you know you see that they, these companies these private companies they have money in adverts they spend millions to advertise products you know marketing products and all that so also then they have the money to equally fund develop developments to their products if they can do this target investors target um, academics you know or researchers you know give them money help us develop this or build this idea or help us change this we don't want this to be this way do you have a, can you like you know walk your way out fund these companies sorry fund these individuals then that could be a very viable way of um, improving the science and technology space of nigeria um, because that's what most countries do actually private sectors are the ones who fund uh, research and um, even if the private sectors are not willing to fund research then if universities or institutions can prioritize research that could be another thing rather you know because there's also something called internet generated revenues in these universities so what do they do with igrs it's not like they're always building most of buildings in universities or institutions are third fund or donated buildings so what do you do with your igr you know you can also channel a very huge amount because it's an institution it's a learning institution so research you have the top priority so channel the bulk of your igr to research and don't frustrate your staff you know because sometimes you the process to even get little fund from institutions is so hopefully and that you might just get discouraged and then give up about your research idea and just allow it die with you and before you bring it out it becomes obsolete because the world is changing the technology space is dynamic so if you have an idea and you don't bring it out immediately in a couple of years that idea will become outdated something else will have been developed and the beautiful thing is that even though it was at that instance it was um 
a very good idea. Buildings at that time would have been good. Even if it becomes obsolete in the future, it helps in the body of research by bringing like a good reference to continue rather than beginning and continuing. So at that, people just develop, then you develop. And then that's how um, technology grows. Because for instance, let's say your computer is 360 degrees hybrid. First com computers are not 360 degrees hybrid. They were very bulky desktops and you know working uh, personals, um, personal computers and all that, very bulky. So people were, they, the technology was improving, getting smaller, you know, wider, more efficient and all that. So improvements is actually the bedrock of technological growth. It's not really more or less, I just come with a very new technology. New technologies are not really new, they're just developments of previous ones. So if somehow researchers get attention, then um, you would be able to tackle the issue of technological growth. Because again, if I work on something today, someone else will see what I've done, read my material and be like, oh, have an idea, maybe I can tweak this. Then tweak, when the person also has the avenue of tweaking it, maybe works with you or independent research and then improves it, then you have another new technology. Then before you know, another person to comes up, even yourself, you'll be like, okay, now let me try it this way or let me change this and see what happens. And then you do that and then you have a better result. That way you see that your techno your curve is, is exponentially growing. You know, our technology in Nigeria is growing, but it's actually a very slow curve. We need a rapid growth to meet up with the, you know, the world race in technology. So if um, attention is not given to funding, because it's not that we don't have intelligent people in Nigeria, we do. It's just that most of them don't have the avenue to bring up their ideas or like develop their concepts. And then most of them end up like leaving the country to places where they can get um, the, the uh, needed funding or respect to pursue their ambitions or their design and concepts. And that's what is really happening in the real world right now, because um, there's the technology in, um, in other countries, when I say other countries, I mean, some of these countries will go to these developed countries, they are more practical based. For instance, my current project topic is something that is supposed to solve a real problem. It's not some concepts that I'm going to develop, it's something I'm going to do to develop on an existing technology. It's actually very interesting to think about. Like I'm just doing my master's and already my project topic is to improve on an existing technology in a very um, in a very new area. So autonomous vehicle anyway, that's just a general scope of what I'm working on, autonomous vehicle. And uh, so imagine that I'm working on a project that if I am successful in it, or at the, at the end of the day, if it go, it will likely go to market. And if it goes to market, it's a product of the university. The university can claim right of it, obviously. But at the same time, it shows that I've helped to contribute to technology and that way other people develop. And then that's how you see things move in this country, in these developed countries, because they give attention to real problems that they solve, you know, with funding. As a matter of fact, okay. yeah. Um can you still uh, you know viewers are, are are listening to you? Okay. Uh, viewers are listening to you. You have you have, you have spoken much. Can you still remind viewers of, of, of your topic? Remind viewers yeah. of your topic. My project topic? Yes. Yeah, okay. Working guide shield for visually impaired persons. Okay. You can hear him, viewers. And the, and today, uh, this afternoon, it's not only me I, I have that we're going to ask uh, in, in Mr. Gifts. Uh, I have with me Miss uh, Lupua Benjamin. Ms. Benjamin, can you greet the wall? Hello, hello everyone. Okay, as you can hear her, she greets everybody. Yeah, hi. Um, um basically, uh, before beforehand, when we are talking, yeah, um, looking at your your, your project research, yeah, understand, and looking at the pandemic called poverty in Nigeria, yeah, you know, I said earlier when I started uh, this um, program. Yeah. Uh, we started personally. Uh, I can't say I can't say only me, uh, because my friend is here. Uh, uh, we said that poverty. Uh, we, we started defining democracy in Nigeria. Is that I personally define democracy in Nigeria as the government of the pocket and the pocket of their family. Yeah. That's what I define democracy. And I'm a political individual. So people, viewers, understand me. I'm a political, I'm someone, I'm a Pan-Africanist. Definitely love Nigeria, a diehard uh, citizen of Nigeria. And I always want to see good things happening to Nigeria. And also as a scientist. 
Yeah. Looking at how things have been happening, and with this project that you have done, and I we raise a, a question that has been raised is what is the fate of research and development in Nigeria? We know in research, as you said earlier, in research that we always improve, we work upon it. You understand? And I want to say a good kudos to Modibo Adama University of Technology for training you to this level. Yeah. But they train you, they gave you the exposure that you needed. And all the lecturers that taught you well, I will say kudos to them. But yet, I, I have something that I want to point. I want to, have, I, I want to point an accusing finger to Ministry of Science and Technology of Nigeria. The accusing finger that I want to point is this. What do you think this, this ministry can do? Because we have universities, we call ourselves University of Technology. And in each university, not if we have conventional university and university of technology. And yeah. even in the conventional universities, we have different graduates in engineering, in physical sciences, in life sciences that do research, even agriculture and other stuff like that, that do research. That, so that it's going to elevate um, the suffering in which people are having, are experiencing. So personally for me, and you as a researcher that you have done this, when I was looking at your research work, I was thinking, um, is there no way that this your research work will be communicated to the Ministry of Science and Technology? Not even only Ministry of Science and Technology, as you said, you pointed out to other, other, other private individuals that they go, uh, they sponsor do some adverts, stuff like that. I also, that's what you see, like that, that's what is happening in UK. Some PhD in UK, a master's in UK, it is not even the government, it is private sector that sponsor the PhD for students to come and do, and do research so that it will elevate, uh, go to metamorphose and give a quality product to the society and they will make money. And in, in that way, poverty is going to, be going to has already been eradicated. Sure. Like now, you pointed out something and I was crying. One of the things that was when I was looking at your, you say the inspiration came from your, your cousin. Is it cousin, right? Yeah, cousin. That due to gl glaucoma was blind yeah. and yeah. and now he's no longer he's no longer with us. Yeah. Full to glory. So sorry for that. Yeah, thanks. Um I I also when I was looking at your research, coming from a poor background, living with poor people and looking at how these children of these people that are the unfortunate incident, because nobody tried to choose the position he or she find for himself. The unfortunate incidents that happen that their parents are blind. Yeah. They have to be leading their parents in one way or the other places to go. And education is the, 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 uh, deprived of normal education. Yeah. So do you, as I said, I want to return the question again. Do you think that if the Nigerian government or other private institution will try to contact you, you are going to be willing to develop this uh, research to a qualitative Nigerian-made product into a technological issue, sector, sorry, sector, that we believe is going to go far, that our own, <laughs> our own will be, will be delivered from this pandemic. Because I know that once you're going to set up a factory on this issue, there are going to be another revalidation of this work and people are going to be employed. When people are going to be employed, is going to improve the GDP, the gross domestic product of the country. Apart from increasing the gross domestic product of the country, it's going to stop poverty. People are going to have jobs. So do you think that you are going to have that time and accept uh, the challenge to this? Before I invite uh, just two, two minutes to answer this question before uh, Ms. Lupa will ask you her own question. All right. So um, you asked, um, I mean, I could cite four categories of question here. So the first one, science and technology, um, their interests. So the truth is, um, I think I'm not very impressed with the way the Ministry of Science and Technology handles um, university um, research and um, stuff like that. Because, um, yeah, first of all, what stops them from having active participation in some of this research? There are a lot of um, students doing outstanding researches in school, you know, PhD, undergraduate, you know, post-doctorate um, level two. So um, they don't have a lot of um, attention, you know, they don't give a lot of attention, sorry, I mean, and to this research. And even if they do, like most times when they come 
or when they seek interest in some of this research, they don't seek the interest because they want to develop it. No. When they invite you or they tell you we like your research, most likely it's because they want you to compete against others. Okay, you come, you compete about your project, you do exhibitions, and then the winner, they will give the winner maybe 100,000, 200,000, maybe a million or 10 million, and that is it. Okay, you give the, the winner, you, you make them compete. You give the winner some cash price or whatever. And then that's the end. They are not interested on how, um, they're not interested in what you do with the money. And then the other people that don't win, obviously in a competition, there'll be a winner. It doesn't mean that person is really in the real sense, the best. Maybe the presentation, organization, and the idea or maybe the articulation of the concept was just better than others. So the other people that, that didn't win too, what do you do for them? Like, do you give them a driving um, um, environment to develop their ideas, you know, to improve on it? And uh, again, again, uh, after the competition, what next? Because mostly when you see science and competition, uh, science, Ministry of Science and Technology do anything, it boils down to competition. They have this annual uh, exhibition they do, I think, Ministry of Science and Technology. Yes. And more or less the exhibition, they'll just do exhibition and that's it. After, usually during the exhibition, we, you, you end, we have winners, and then the winners get money, and then that's the end. And next year, again, they do exhibition. Okay, after the exhibition, what next? The technology is there. What do you do with them? Do you just toss them around? What do you, Technology should not be wasted. You know, uh, a lot has been put into some of these things. So if you develop them, it's just like uh, it's mutually beneficial to the person who developed it and also to you. And then that's one area. Uh, I think they really need to improve on the way they handle um, uh, some of these uh, ingenious um, innovations that come out of Nigeria. And then um, the next one, children of, um, yeah. So children of these visually impaired persons. Yes, as I said earlier, like um, the issue of visual impairedness has a bit of a ripple effect or ripple impact on the society. It affects um, the government, it affects the individual, it affects the people around the individuals. It also affects the community as a matter of fact, the environment, the physical environment. So the way it affects the children is most directly and depriving them of proper education because yeah, they become caregivers for these visually impaired people. And okay, they lack, they don't go to school to get the education. Then they only like support their, you know, visually impaired um, parents or counterparts as the case may be. And then after that, what next for these children? You know, they don't grow up with proper education. Without education, well, education is not always the key. They say education is the key. But education, we put it so formal education, like it's not always the success. Education is multifaceted. It mustn't be between the four walls of university. You also learn vocation and other traits and skills and all that. Those are also education. So again, these children need to have a form of education rather than just waste away. So those are talents being wasted. And then, uh, yeah, and something needs to be done, you know, because technologies like this that kind of uh, um, relieves some disadvantage um, people in the society can really help in improving the equality across board. And then um, employment, as you said, yes, it's true. If technologies like this, not just mine, in fact, mine is just an undergraduate level uh, research, more, um, more outstanding research have been done at postgraduate level, you know, and some of this research, they waste, as I said earlier. So if you, if somehow we tap into this research and, um, uh, you know, we're able to help these people, you know, connect them with the right um, agencies or businesses or investors and all that, and then get their ideas out. It creates employment because when you start to develop devices, you don't just need one area of, um, and, techno and you don't just need one specialty or one uh, pastel to design your device. You will need other people. And then those people somehow, you're creating an, an opportunity for more people to be employed. For instance, my shoe. I didn't just design the shoe alone. I had to buy products that was empowering um, people. I had to also like consult a shoe buckler. Because I worked hand in hand with a shoe cobbler. Sorry, wait, what's the word? <laughs> cobbler, yeah, shoe cobbler or whatever. Shoe shiner, as we call it in Nigeria. He helped me make my shoe. <laughs> Obviously, that was employment for me because I had to pay him. So things like that, you know, it goes across the board. It's not that uh, anyone is an island on his own in research, no. When you are doing your research, you also involve other aspects of the economy. And that way you are improving the economy, you are diversifying the growth. So that's it. And um, obviously the challenges right now, hmm. uh, there are a lot of challenges. Like we really, really need to change our mindset in Nigeria. The priorities are always wrong in Nigeria. Most 
problem as I said, problem um government is for the pocket or for their children's pocket, all that. They are not far from the truth. The truth is that they are just interested in power. Most of our leaders are just interested in power, and that's it. Power. What do you do with the power when you get the power? Do something for your society also. In as much as you are doing helping your family. Okay, or well, you are still for your family as the case may be. I don't want to double into that, you know, the the whatever they do is between them and the law and God. But regardless, also help the society. What are you doing for the society? And not just that you do something little, you come and you build, you maybe you buy them a transformer and that's all, or you make a, a manual boho and then you feel like you have done enough. You come, you snap pictures, you do grand uh, opening ceremonies or commissioning ceremonies and all that. And then all of a sudden, the media is um, all over um, and carrying the news, ah, well, this particular politician did this. And that's all. That's not enough. We don't need all that. Yeah. Empower the people, and then the people will be able to solve their own problems their own way. Yeah. So that's it. Um, I think if if um, <laughs> I've answered your questions, then I think these are my points to this uh, this challenge this we Okay. So from what you said, Sam, yeah, I think I think you basically talked about how um, good research and technology yeah. is supposed to help. Um, improve the health and well-being of yeah. the citizens of Nigeria yeah. is yeah. being put aside and then um, we don't see we don't see development in terms of um, producing good qualitative um, facilities yeah. or equipment in our country so do you think that this problem do you think that this problem starts from the university level okay like your work i've seen it it's very good i must say let me commend you sir on that work it's very good and 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 um i really want to just find out do you think that this problem starts from just the university level okay all right yeah okay so let me answer your question so first of all it doesn't start from the university it starts from the society the truth is um, there's hardly a day on social media where you don't see a post about a kid, you know, in a village who designed maybe a shoe, um, oh, sorry, designed a motor, motorcycle, or designed um, maybe an aeroplane, or designed some kind of funny devices, you know. Sometimes it's not about the university, it's about the society. They do all these things, and that is it. You post them on social media, hey, this kid from this village or from this government school made this device, and then blah, 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 blah. And then that is the end. It gets that coverage, and that is the end. We don't hear anything about that student. We don't hear anything about that particular design or that concept he has established and developed. We don't hear if he has been targeted by maybe uh, a technological firm or maybe the government have sought interest in him, or if he has gotten scholarship by universities or colleges. So again, that's just it. We just hear the news, and we hear the news. We congratulate the kid. We complain about the government, and then it dies there. What happens to, again, as I said earlier, we should just forget about the government, since the government are, are not really willing to practically help in the way yeah. we expect them to, um, to, to really contribute to our problems. So yeah. why can't individuals sponsor these kids? We have people in the society who are well-to-do, they are properly placed. So why not, okay, you see this news, you're interested, hey, encourage this kid, um, maybe sponsor, um, maybe give him some form of scholarship to a college or whatever, you know, or you yeah, are connecting with relevant um, agencies. Some of them, they have these connections, they can do it. And then if you do it, you will become an investor to that technology somehow. And then also you are helping that kid and you're also somehow in the long run, you will help yourself. And not just that, when you do that, you, you're encouraging others to, you know, think outside the box. Others will love to develop things. And then when they do that, because they know that when, when they're able to come up with something, then they have somehow some kind of benefit from it. So it will improve competitiveness, it will improve um, the technological, um, mindset and it will instill the technological mindset in people, sorry, and then people will love to develop. And so the issue of research and technology and all that is not really from institutional level. Even the societies, we see this. And then the mindset of people towards te um, technology is not very keen. The only thing we're interested in about is to complain and complain all the time. We have rich people, they're just somewhere in the back <laughs> making money for themselves and they don't, they don't, they don't do much because sometimes um, even if the rich people don't want to do anything, those societies, those communities where these kids do these things, you can, some of, they have, um, they collect tax, they do, they have money. I mean, societies, there's hardly no community, there's hardly a community in Nigeria that doesn't collect some form of levies from its citizens or its um, inhabitants, sorry. So when they do all these things, what do they do with the money? They can also like um, try to improve themselves, their little 
um, carved area of the, the country, you know, improve it by the, um, promoting their own indigenous technology or in their, their own, um, you know, researchers, in quote. Yeah, the kids. There, there are many things that can be done to tackle this problem, aside relying so much on the government. So it's not about the government anymore. It's all about people now. It's all about mindsets of community. It's all about what we prioritize. Actually, as a matter of fact, we spend money on tithes in churches. It's not bad. But at the same time, the same way we have money to give to God, we also have, we should have money somehow to sacrifice for our own growth. You know, in religious body, in church monks, we do arms, we do all that. The money comes from somewhere. And then that money can also, you can also get some. That's to say that also, if you are interested in your society, your community, you can invest in the community too. Yeah, because it's not all about what the government will do for you, it's what you will do for your community now. Yes. That's what I feel. So it's not as to answer your question directly. It's not what a, it's not a university level challenge. Yeah, the university level challenge is the major eye. Um, you know, is where we look up to, you know, for research and all that, because it's expected that yeah, the peak of the work is done there. But at the same time, we have gifted kids who do some of these things, you know, without any formal education. Somehow they make it, they get it to work from their ingenuity, you know, the way they are able to reason and. Um, the way they are able to solve problems. It's all about um, problem solving skills and critical reasoning. So some of them, some of these kids have analytical gifts that are just um, God given. Or so maybe com community, you know, community changes the way you think. So maybe the community where you are will influence you and then maybe, you know, um, help you think in a certain way, think outside the box in whatever way it is. And then if every issue is tackled at every structure, you do your own, the community does their own part, the university, Again, the university has a little crippled in the sense that they don't get a lot of funding or attention from the government. And that is because most of our funding comes from the government. At the same time, you know, they are still, as I said, it's not really the end of the world. There's also internal, internally generated revenues that can be used to support research. And then we also have the government too, having a rethink of their priorities. It's good to prioritize other sectors of the economy, as a matter of fact, but at the same time, give, it, give technology and science a bit of attention. They are giving them attention, but not to the required standard or to the required standard of the 21st century. This is pathetic as a matter of fact. That's okay, that's very good, sir. Yeah, thank um, you. I, I also want to I also want to ask this. You talked about these private individuals that can totally help some of these kids. Yeah. Maybe give them scholarship or just fund their research so that they would be able to use it. Okay, we have like we have like, like big companies um, that are privately owned. Yeah. Okay. So, do you think the reason why this some of these people do not really think it's necessary to invest in this research or to help this these little ones coming up with these um, ideas that are very good? Do you think it's because um, um, we do not have this? this strong mindset in our communities about research and development, we don't, we don't feel or think it's very important. Okay. And what do you think, and what do you think we should do to create more awareness about this? And also in what way do you think we can help change this? Because these are problems and we're talking about real life problems. You, yeah. you made something that was very, very good very interesting and something that could have been developed into and it would have been able to help a lot of people, especially those caregivers you talked about. But because nobody really showed any interest in it, that technology is just lying there and it's not being used, right? Yeah. So what what are these what are these steps that you feel we can we can be able to to take to just help the government realize that they need to do something about this. All right. So um, these companies that I mentioned earlier, private sectors, the truth is they also develop themselves um, because of course, um, a particular company developing a product will not develop that product over um, 10 years. Somehow we see improvements in the market, but what, how do they come about their improvements? They mostly come about their improvements by importing technology. So they import technologies or they hire foreign experts. That's the problem. Somehow they feel that is the best way to go. But they don't know that doing all these things is more expensive than exploiting their own um, communities or exploiting uh, indigenous um, development or innovations. It's more expensive to import technology. If you own a te technology, the initial startup could be high, but in the long run, 
the cost to profit and uh, the, the cost to profit margin will become so high and uh, will become so low so you have more profit at the end of the day initially setting those um like maybe investing in all this research and all this is very expensive but when you finally have your technology market and then you start producing or whatever whatever you do with the technology you bring it to market the service if, if that's the case you realize that later you make a lot of profit that compensates and overcomes and overtakes the initial cost you have um, put in place so if you check the cost you put and you 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 have to like um commit to this indigenous technology and all that it's high but it's not as high as important technology itself or hiring foreign experts and then the, the more they do that the more they make indigenous researchers feel irrelevant but that is wrong because we come out of the country and then we now own the science space in um, other places this we go to these foreign countries you you go to for instance we we in nigeria without respect in terms of science and technology and uh, in terms of research and all that because obviously we have this mindset that uh, we, we boost, you know are better than us but at the same time, some of us leave the country, we go to this um, Oibo country, in quotes, and then we perform better than them. So what is the loophole there? It's simply because of mindset. The society doesn't give us respect there. And then that, uh, sorry, the, the, the government, the private sectors and all that don't give us the respect. And then that um, like showers down to the community and they don't give us that respect. So they don't give researchers that respect. So we just feel uh, it's a Nigerian-made product to be substantial. And the reason it's substandard is not because that was the concept behind it. It's because there was no enough funding to make it standard or to purchase the, the um, you know, um, 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 materials that has the better structural integrity to develop those devices. It's just because we don't have the money or we don't have the app, um, the access to better um, materials to incorporate our technology. That's just why it's not standard. At the same time, too, the mindset, even some of our researchers, regardless of the fact that they have this um, concept of... Um, you know, leading innovations. Many of them to still want to make profits. And then they want to make profit, you give them even the money and then somehow they spend a little on the research and spend the others. All these things too has to do with the way we think in Nigeria. Even we also have, um, researchers also have their own faults. You give them the money, some of them will do a little bit with research and then spend the rest. You see, you give a, a researcher a million, um, so a amount of grants right now and then you notice two weeks later he has bought a new car, he's getting married to a new wife or, or building something, acquiring a property somewhere. It happens. <laughs> so that's the thing. Sometimes too, the mindset needs to change, needs to be corrected, even from the level of the other end. But at the same time, more has to be done in this other side of it, in the sense that um, the funding itself should come in the first place. Then be able to monitor the funding. Yeah. I bring the attention. Then also, not just don't just provide. Also have a way of monitoring and evaluating progress, and keeping yeah. a good eye on your investments. So that is it. Now, what to do? As I said, is it is it, both ways. We change our mindsets. We also promote our own technology. Some, somehow, like, yeah, it's good that all these um, um, international countries or foreign experts have um, better technologies. And that is because they have improved on their previous technologies. They didn't just wake up with this um, good or improved te technologies. It was development over the years and their revolutions and all that. So if we also start from somewhere and start developing ours with time, we will also have that credibility to meet what we call um, best international standard practice, um, international best standard uh, practices or whatever you call it in that time. And then uh, when we do that, then we begin to have equal level of respect and research. And then when that happens, you know, we more or less, you start seeing engineers and you'll be seeing less white people, you'll be seeing more black people um, organizing or spearheading or supervising research in Nigeria, um, infrastructure, the infrastructural developments in Nigeria. You see, them constructing roads and then you go there you notice the supervisor is a foreigner and then the rest of the workers suffering under the sun and uh, under the sun sorry uh indigenous or uh, whatever and it's not like they the honest reason it's not like the supervisors know more than the people working or the other people be, be, um, beneath them but somehow we just have this weird respect that if it's a foreigner then it's, it has better quality yeah, these are all challenges and then again mindset needs to be changed investments needs to be made and um redirection needs to be involved you know we need to prioritize we need to also bring attention and you know like spotlight some of these challenges and make it public and then more importantly um regulations because that's one thing if the government will not give us money they should give us regulations you don't give us money give us regulations make regulations that favor 
indigenous technologies. If you don't want to spend your money that you're taking for your family and all that, okay, keep it to yourself. But at least give us the regulations that protects our um, our local contents and all that, or that improves on them. That could work too. So like, to me, I feel these are ways that we can improve some of these issues we have in the space of technology and science. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um. Before. Um. Before. I, sorry. Um. You know, on the course, you know, to of finding vaccine mm. to this pandemic virus. Um. Yeah. Looking at it, you know, this is, as we say that I'm um, the first time, we defined, the poverty, as. Lack of money, mm. inadequate education, poor healthcare system many more I and mean, a lot of things that we encapsulate the definition of poverty and that warrants it to become a pandemic and it is because of this pandemic called poverty in nigeria we have issue of unemployment mm -hmm. we have the insecurity in nigeria we have the banditry we have even nepotism that is happening you're looking at the nepotism that is happening a lot of top uh, the insurgency that is happening so on this journey that uh, Popka International uh, starts to see how vaccine is created. So do you think that is it only in the STEM sector that this vaccine can be realistic? Okay. So short answer to your question. Yes, it's STEM. <laughs> then um, a more indirect answer would be no. <laughs> What I mean by yes is that, of course, the uh, medicine or whatever, pharmacy, you know, all the people that, are, you know, the genetic engineers and all that, that get hands on with the search for vaccines, you know, where they're all science based STEM. However, it's not all about that. There are other things to, to consider when you are tackling issues such as, like, um, you know, uh, acquiring vaccines to an infection. There are also <laughs> human, human impacts. I'm, I'm talking about the yeah. pandemic called poverty. Poverty. Oh, yes. Sorry, I'm I was just thinking about the vaccine. You know, when you yeah. know, yes, we, 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 our journey is to get the vaccine for the pandemic poverty because poverty is a virus. Okay, we have okay. established, we have established the fact that it's a virus already. So oh. we want this vaccine. So that's All our right. vaccine. Is it only okay. on the STEM sector okay. that we can be able to have this vaccine for this pandemic? All right. So the answer is no this time around. No. Not about STEM. <laughs> Okay. So the problem is that uh, we have business, business. We have um, humanities. All these things are just ways, are different aspects of the economy, and um, if they are improved too. Well, the beautiful thing is about the, uh, about um, some of these other humanities and all these things that they can actually practice more efficiently, you know, um, than the people in STEM. People in STEM needs more, and we need more attention in the sense that, um, yeah, we are almost incapacitated if we don't have the money and all that to do you know, to like improve on our uh, knowledge and or maybe in, in, um, bring out our ideas that will now um, uh, in the long run improve the economy and all that. People in the sciences, more or less, you know, the regulations, research on impact, ethics, businesses, and the other parts of um, body, body of knowledge as a matter of fact. So everybody's involved anyway, but it affects people in the STEM more because physical, um, like economical growth, in as much as you also need economists and um, businesses and all that to ensure that you are doing the right thing. Because sometimes it's not all about, there's also economy of scale in some of these things we do. So all these things are researches that are done by the non-STEM uh, counterparts. So we need everybody, as a matter of fact, it's, a, it's supposed to be a collaborative effort between everyone and to, between every aspect to, to tackle this issue. And then um, if you bring your own quota, I bring my own quota, you bring, I bring my physical know-how Sorry, I bring my um technical my know how. Another person brings his technical know how, another person brings his support, another one brings his community and knowledge, another one brings his ethical um base, and then you know that way everybody is able to sandwich their um contributions to a greater, you know, a div um, greater product that will have significant impact on technology or the technological growth of the nation. So it's a it's it's um it's a tax of everyone as a matter of fact. And more important, also the tax of the government. They are not left out. So, but it, it starts from the community to, you know, the researchers, people in uni, people in the sectors, and then businesses to the top level of the government. 
Okay, um, Ms. Lipo, you have anything? Yes, okay, like you said, I, I think it's it's still the same thing. We need everybody to come together and just work at this. Yeah. It's not just science related. Mm -hmm. I think it has to do every sector, every sector of the of the economy has to be up and working. So when we are when we are trying to look for these uh, vaccines, we are not only we are not only going to be looking at just looking at it from one perspective. We need to look at it from all the other aspects so that everything will just come together and work to just push everything okay. forward. Okay. So um, let me also interject something here. What I was saying earlier when I was talking about the vaccines in the real sense of it, that is um, talking about the virus. So I'll use the analogy of the typical vaccine for the biological infection in the, in the sense that um, the vaccine is our solution to the problem and the infection of the virus is the overseas. So again, as I was trying to establish earlier, um, vaccines that are brought to market are not just the work of researchers alone. We also have people who run ethical and uh, ethics. We also have people who run business side. We have people who run um, um, social impact. So all these people don't just, I mean, it's, it's not, sometimes it's not about just making the vaccine. You also need other people's input to like the AstraZeneca and um, the um, cyber, um, Pfizer vaccines, I mean, the common ones that are out, they, they are not just the product of the work of STEM-based researchers. Other people too, from other aspects of um, the body of knowledge contributed heavily. Just that the bulk of the work was on the researchers because yeah, we need the physical product. But again, impacts, measurement of um, business, measurement of um, economy, um, somehow a scale of um, 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 futuristic um, impact in the sense of side, um, side effects and then how it in, um, changes the dynamics of our uh, um, humans and then businesses and then um, even the environment itself you know, was also studied. So again, bringing this back home, the issue of the poverty virus in Nigeria too is not supposed to be the collective effort of just technology itself. Yeah, technology is key for um, eradicating um, 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 poverty and all that. But at the same time, you also need the uh, direct inputs from other aspects of the economy. You need um, people, even the, um, the law enforcement, you need, uh, of course, you need law enforcement, you need legal, um, legal inputs because, again, it's a battle out there, even in the search for technology or in the race for technology. It's a fierce battle. You still need the protections from the law enforcement. You need, um, you cannot, I, I cannot um, run my business smoothly if um, we're in insecurity. I cannot, um, I cannot run my te technology or bring them out or sell my products or improve on my technology or um, do something as if I have someone stealing my idea and then somehow my legal team is not able to um, protect my property right. So all these things, as I said earlier, everyone is involved. Again, the community needs to support. At the same time, too, we also need to patronize our own local products. If I do all this and we spend the money and then again, we have the mindset made in Nigeria, it doesn't have quality, then it's wrong. For instance, we have innocent vehicle, the case of innocent vehicle in Nigeria. It's a very good thing that most of the army vehicles used in Nigeria are from innocent vehicle. I'm so impressed by that aspect of um, develop, uh, involvement here. The Nigerian army have done so well in that area, like so well, they are scoring so highly in that. They are, most of their generals drive cars from innocent vehicles. Most of the armored personnel, so I, I don't know how to call them, most of the trucks they use in the field are from innocent. So that is a good way of handling it. And we see that they perform very well. These vehicles perform very well. Now, the problem is that only a few of us know that most of those things that we see used to tackle or to fight insurgency in the, you know, in the troubled areas are from innocent vehicles. Innocent vehicles and indigenous technology. If some of things like that are publicized fully and adequately or properly, people will begin to have faith in the local products. And then, oh, wow, made in Nigeria and it's very sturdy. Then you will see more people will start buying these products or start patronizing local products. And from there, you will have other companies or other um, production lines that will come up to market and bring out, they'll be confident now to bring out their products. Or uh, we have Dangote, it's made in Nigeria. We'll, almost everybody, if you want to buy floor cement, it's Dangote. You know, somehow, I mean, I'm, I'm not saying, but I know it's the, they are the kings of the market in their, in their niche. So it's not that uh, some of, sometimes we look at one aspect and we ignore the other. Yeah, okay, we respect um, Dangote floor and all that. So why don't we respect um, a civil engineer from a Nigerian university when you are constructing your bridges? 
and then all of a sudden you are importing foreigners to be the um, head co contractors. So you see all these things, you know, we do something and then we turn a complete um, blind eye to another side. We're not also being honest to ourselves. So most of the things we do are just somehow half hazard. Okay, um, uh, gifts. Yes. Nice having you on this platform. Thank you. <laughs> but and yet, you know, there are a lot of a lot of questions. A lot. <laughs> a lot, a lot, a lot, because it is yeah. my heart cry. Yeah. So much eradicated. Sure. We want to have this vaccine that um, we don't want to make the mistake that our fathers made. Mm -hmm. Our fathers made a serious mistake, a blunted mistake. I want to say that without okay. apology. All our fathers, all our fathers, as long as you are 45 years and above, you are part of this issue that is happening in Nigeria. <laughs> Hear me, come and arrest me. From 45 <laughs> years and above, you are existing your life in this, in, this, in this Nigerian country. You are part of the problem we are suffering. That's the truth. That's the truth. So, we that are young, we will want to do our own part to see we have a greater nation. You understand? It's not about it's not about going to be ranting here and there. We want to be able to present something intellectually. Yes, we have been to the university. After going to the university, what else? Okay, before I continue, you know, I, I can talk a lot, a lot, a lot. But viewers at home, and another I have another question for gifts. Yes. Viewers at home. Um uh, gift. Let's say, paraventure, yeah. you are appointed as the Minister of Science and Technology yeah. in Nigeria, with all the exposure you have. Yes, thank you. And I want to use a, a similar scenario, a real life situation. 2017, I remember three or four years we were doing, we are undergoing our industrial training, the internship or industrial training, 2017. So let's say it repeats itself, and with the present situation of political rigging in Nigeria. Okay. Okay. And okay. inadequate power supply in Nigeria. You have two students that did well. One in from physics department. This is this is a, this, this one I want to tell you is that it's a is is a graduate of physics from the Adam University of Technology, two of them. IK, I will call them by name. I have right to call them by name because they have done wonderful, they have they have done wonders. IK did uh his own project, an electronic voting machine. This electronic voting machine, after you cast your vote, it, it will count the valid votes. These are the valid votes for this party. These are the valid votes for this party. These are the invalid votes. And these are the total vote casters. And Tony. Excuse me, please. Just give me a moment. I need to myself. OK. <laughs> all right. OK, viewers are to all. Um, we are still talking on uh, poverty. poverty virus in Nigeria. Poverty virus in Nigeria. Mm -hmm. And looking at it, the poverty virus in Nigeria, we have a lot and a lot, a lot of things. And today we have in our midst one of our own. And you can see three of us here. Uh, all of us are graduate and product of Modibo Adama University of Technology, Yola. We said that we are not going to keep quiet. We want to yeah. contribute our fat our part to the nation building, national growth of this country. Ms. Lupo Benjamin here with us, she's a graduate of biochemistry, the best female graduating student of biochemistry. She have done well and GIFT is an engineering student. Um, and I myself, I'm a graduate of physics also and doing my MSc at the University of Glasgow. So welcome back, Mr. GIFT. Thank, Thank you, viewers, at all. Yeah, sorry for that nature. <laughs> yeah, I understand. Welcome yeah. back. Uh, as I was saying, if you are the Minister of Science and Technology, IK presented to you, you because during the course of your uh, presentation, you said that the Minister of Science and Technology used to under, uh, uh, organize an, uh, an expo program, is it an uh, exhibition program, mm. in which the reason why I'm saying this thing is that I saw it, and I, without apology, uh, because it is recorded, engineer Obonaya Ona, is the, oh, yeah. uh, is the Minister of Science Technology. Now, put yourself in a shoe. That, in, sorry, let me call it, I forget, uh, let me address, Honorable Minister, Engineer Dr. Obonaya. Uh, he is the Minister of Science Technology. So gift, yeah. putting yourself in the position, in the shoe of Engineer Dr. Obonaya as a Minister of Science Technology. As, as of 2017, and 
looking at the present situation in Nigeria, the lack of power, inadequate power supply, and the political turmoil, especially the rigging that is taking place in, in, the, the, in, in, in the political sector, we don't have, uh, I, uh, will I say, regularity in election, during election. And two students, and I will say that I'm proud to be associated with them, and they, because they come from my department, yeah. uh, after 2017, IK presented to you his own project, a research that he did that to eradicate or to mitigate, let me just use the word mitigate, mitigate rigging in an election. And Tony presented to you a generator looking at you know the, the lack of the inadequate power supply we have. That normal generator that uh, is, it, is it up to two horsepower. This I pass my neighbor. Is it up to two horsepower? I, yeah, it okay. That you can use it to iron, use an electric iron to iron your clothes with it. You know, on a normal basis, you can't use that to iron your clothes. It's going to break down the generator. But he make his own, he tried to make it a convertible. Some, some kind of research that you can use that generator to iron your clothes. You can use you can use it even to put your refrigerator to your fridge. Understand? Or even if normal, let's say the normal lights we are consuming, the unit you are consuming, there's a, a device that he created that if you want to iron, the rate at which the energy is consumption of energy is going to be very low. Understand? So with these two people giving you this three solution, what do you think you're supposed to do for them? Okay. All right, so thank you for that question. And then thank you for giving me the hypothetical honors of being the Minister of Science and Technology. <laughs> it's fun to think about that. All right, so, um, all right, practical answer. Let's say um, I am the Minister of um, Science and Technology in Nigeria and then Again, putting it in context, in exact context, as you said, 2017 was when these guys um, graduated, right? No, they presented. They presented, yeah. okay, they presented in 2017. Yes, because they were yeah. serving. Now, look at this. As a reasonable minister, you know that um, someone presented um, something uh, on electric, electronic voting. Yes. That was 2017. And the general yes. election was in 2019. Yes. Okay. So, you know, there was, there was like two years of gap between the two incidents. So if um, I am the Minister of Science and Technology, a logical approach to such innovation is to, you know, put a public eye on it. First of all, I'll bring it to public notice that, okay, there's this technology and it could be very helpful in 2017. Now, the reason I will do this in 2019, sorry, which is two years later, it will really solve some of our problems, is first of all, to bring out the initial awareness. Now, when this comes up, there will be a lot of debate on this, like, hey, we don't trust this. What if it fails on that day? Or what if somehow people hack it? Or what if something is done? The fact that you have brought it out early within that 2017, and that, range, and that um, um, year of 20, uh, between the 2017 year, oh, sorry for the English anyway. Yeah, if you do that, you already bring, uh, have this initial public um, awareness to it. Now, again, many people will have this skeptical approach of um, perception about that kind of te technology because we have trust issue in Nigeria. That's the truth. Again, now by bringing it out early, you are not just bringing it out for public um, awareness. You are also bringing it out for improvement. So that way, you have two years to improve on any, um, any uh, let's say, loopholes it will have or any form of um, uh, backdoor that can be accessed to you know, rig election or maybe cause um, election anxiety or maybe uh, reduce the credibility of an election. You have two years to research into the impact or maybe possible um, mishaps, risk assessments as they call it. If you do this risk assessment, then again, within that two years, you are able to implement your, uh, your, implement maybe your findings to further improve on such devices. And not just that, when you do that, again, everything is kept on public eye. That way, when you do this, you publish it, and then you maybe put, um, make it well known. Confidence of people will increase in that product, and they'll be very happy to use it. Anybody who has problem with it is someone who has an issue with free and fair election, definitely, because we know most types of election, most elections in Nigeria are not really free and fair. Come on, we know. Uh, yeah, they can say whatever they like, but we know this is not always free and fair. And people, there are many people that they, they thrive best 
an unfair election because that is the only way they maintain their power. So again, those people, you will notice the attack from all these people. But again, if you know very well that this technology is good, and then you allow the public to make their sound judgments, the public are the ones that will vote. If the public carries more majority, and then they, they, are, asked, they, they are happy with the improvement and they somehow have credibility in it, then they are willing to vote through it. Again, maybe uh, party loyalists or loyalists of those people that we know that they are not strong, but again, depend on region, might form some kind of funny, um, for funny uh, conspiracy theory or whatever. And then all these things kept to the eyes of the public. So that way you are not keeping it on the low. The public will be the judge and the jury at the same time. That is safe. Now, when you do this, you are not forgetting the guy, the minister, the, the IK. I don't know if it's the IK. Yeah, IK, IK, yeah. IK. So that IK now, again, becomes... Um, the icon of that, um, or would I say, is the main, um, the public face contact, whatever, to that te technology. So that way, they're also giving him some kind of reputation to the public. And then that will also encourage others to come up with ideas. Because the problem we have with youth is that, um, in as much as they don't get attention, and again, the society keeps making it somehow luxurious to be, uh, you know, to be rich fast somehow. Of course, riches, uh, uh, riches is good, or riches are good, or whatever. But um, it's not about starting. Um, I mean, every young person wants to just make money and make money very fast. So, if you're able to redirect and make um, IK a public um, icon, the young, most young people will be influenced to take that part. And then the crime we we suffer most, uh, you know, uh, cyber crime and all that type of stuff that is actually very rampant now and all that. You know, will, will decline because people will now want to follow a more credible and honorable path. Because the truth is, these people that are, are, are involved in all this um, crime or cyber crime, as the case may be, they are not happy doing it per se, but they want to do it because the pressure is on them. Again, that's that aspect. Then uh, if, I don't know if I made any sense anyway. But and then when we talk about the the, the electric ion that you were talking about, the electric ion. Yeah. yeah, I'm actually very curious because in the, the basic, you said that first of all, it allows the I pass my neighbor to be able to power yeah. uh, a very high load device. Okay, so from my engineering standpoint, I'm thinking of only one aspect for now anyway, because I don't have time to practically analyze the technologies I, I, I didn't see. But what I think he did somehow, either he made a form of um, Maybe somehow he had a, an, an intermediary device that kind of directed the load um, input to the oh, yes. If I can recall very well. What it is. Because why I'm saying this is because energy cannot be created, not destroyed anyway. So if the energy is coming from the generator and then the energy is required by the um, pressing ion, then it's either he made a very efficient power um, flow from the generator to the this thing, such that significant power is driven into the load. Or he directed the rest in box too. I'm just happened, saying what happened was, it was this. quite interesting to think about that. You know what happened was this, if yeah. I can recall it very well. Yeah. Uh nothing was nothing was done to the generator. Okay. It, That's it, what I'm saying. Intermediary device. Yes. This in, in the in the socket of the electric ion or the refrigerator they're going to use. Mm. Uh, is it is it as a transistor? It was ease of transistor. Okay. Is it transistor? Is it triac? Tri tri I can't even. I can't recall. That's not just in triac. Uh -huh, triac. Uh -huh, that's that what he used. It was the use of triac. Um, that I can't forget. I can't forget that this exhibition was accompanied by Professor Adetola. All right. Fun. Understand. So yeah. it shows that this these are these are credible. Uh, uh, this is credible work. You understand? Because Professor Adetola was a the HOD then of physics department. You understand? The minister, I was there. What annoyed me was that the minister did not even look at my professor to consider because there is no way that you see. So that's that's one of the cry that I mean also I'm, I'm happy. I'm, it's one of the pain that I'm happy that I'm having now. Understand? For my professor, you understand, Professor Adetola, to be there to carry these uh, students, understand? Graduates, let me say graduates. Yeah. That exhibition, he really trusted the work. I'm sure. You have done, and he's, he, he's, he's, he's a specialist yeah. in, 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 in that sector. So, in, so the the minister, because I, you know, I work. I, I, I by then I was I was doing my internship at Center for Central Technology Development. I was with the minister, like shoulder to shoulder. I wanted to see the minister only just political waving. Hi, look at it. 
and bypass. Nothing was done. I want to tell you till date, it is paining me. It is paining me. So with this kind of mentality we're having, and if it's someone that is educated, yeah. think of it, of it. Before, I was having the mentality that we, the problem we have in the politics is because we do have a lot of people that do not have good formal education. Yeah. But coming to this time now, people, we have the, our vice president is a professor. Yeah. A lot of ministers are, are, are also are engineers and doctors. Senators are also, we have senators that are professors. So it is happening with, 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 with this situation that, and some of them came to UK to study. Some of them to America and having this test of state environment. They cannot, why is it that they don't want to um, replicate what they have seen in this place? And because they have the resources, because they are the people that are power. If you're a professor that is a senator, he's the one that makes laws now. Sure. Isn't it? It's one that makes laws. Let's just forget about the executive. Let's say the executive are under control, like the ministers. But those people that make laws, let me know. Let, but I cannot dispute the fact that I need to also talk about the executive of the government. You understand? Yeah. But those lawmakers that are professors, engineers, doctors, you understand? Yeah. They call themselves all these titles. You understand? Yeah. Even our senior president said is a PhD holder. Our senior president is a PhD holder. What are they doing to see laws governing Nigeria in, yeah. in this area, in this sector? In every sector, more especially that we have this vaccine to eradicate poverty. All right. So um, I didn't actually finish. Uh, what I was trying to say earlier, I mean, if I was a minister in that area, in that aspect of the other technology with the generator. Anyway, my overall, what I was driving at is that it's a fascinating technology. Whatever he did there is actually very interesting. And then a serious minded uh, minister would have to be interested in that to see what happened. Because again, one of the reasons we have power outages in Nigeria is because our load our load demand doesn't meet the supply. So if we have a way of, um, like, um, if we have, have a way of uh, uh, bringing down the load demand by not compromising the performance, then we can make do with the little we have while we seek ways to improve our generation capacity. Now, a serious minister of technology will be interested in that, is of science and technology should have been interested in that kind of innovation and seek a way of expanding it generally to affect the problem of electrification in Nigeria. That's what I'm saying. That's what I was trying to drive at. Because when I was establishing, I was like just thinking of the possible things he did and then for it to work. That's what I was driving at anyway. So it, he has done a good work if he did that. And then it's quite very interesting that someone did as in a, a, a very like um, a serious minded minister. He's my be serious. Maybe he had something troubling his mind that day. I don't know. Maybe. I can't, I wasn't there, so I can't really judge. But if I were the minister and then I see something like that, I'll be curious, I'll be interested. So, and then not just interested, I would love to seek expansion of that to general issues. Now, again, back to your current question. Yes, there are educated people in power and all that, and um, the legislative arm and all that, and uh, they are making the laws and all that. Hmm. Well, yes, they are educated, but the truth is to make law in Nigeria is actually a very complex task because Again, you make the law, you are stepping on toes of many people. Even if you make the law that favors the masses, you still have people that maybe have sponsored your political journey to where you are. They are most very scared of those people. So even if, again, I am very educated and all that, and I had to, and I enter the um, position of power, or I get to the position of top-ranking um, top power in Nigeria, if I didn't get there by public um, mandate, in the sense that really the public people voted me in like to point black and then somehow i relied on a bit of um, political influence godfatherism and uh you know um support and all that of course politics is expensive even your campaigns you need money but at the same time if somehow i was able to manage my fund in a little credible way or even the money i got i got from people who obviously i had a pact with in quote that see i'm taking your money but you don't have any right over me when i get power because the problem is that it's not that they are not they, they don't know the right thing to do. Some of them know the right thing to do, but they are scared because if they do it, they step on toes on they are biting the hands that have fed them. And again, those people that are you know are behind them, which we call commonly call the cabal when it comes to the issue of presidency, they are more powerful in quotes again because it, theoretically the president should have the um, supreme power in the country, oh, and then the legislature should be like a checkmate you know, to the, the presidency. So somehow they have the power, the executive power. But at the same time, we know that in the context of Nigeria, 
cabal to control the country to a high degree. So, and the reason they do this is because they fund campaign. They are the ones that have put such some of, some of those our top ranking um, leaders there. So, out of fear and out of respect, they know the right thing to do, but they are unable to do it because they are crippled. Their wings have been clipped by um, some of the favors they have taken. So, sometimes it's all about the education. You might have the education. If you have the education and all that, and you come out, and you try to run political, um, um, to run a political race, and somehow someone who's uneducated, you know, has a way of um, influencing the masses. You know, some of them they know this politics very well, and then they overpower you, they win. Then what's the gain? Yes, so that's the problem. If somehow we have a way of getting more credible elections that leads and uh, you know allow people who are in power to have a bit of independence, then they are able to make policies that they are honestly that doesn't to their to themselves they know fully well that is the right thing to do and they're able to do it to a high um, to a high achievable standard or even to an ethical standard. They are able to if they are able to do this, then again it will be a pure reflection of their education. Because that is what majorly happens when you see educated people making the wrong moves. It's not that they don't know what to do. It's not that they are incapacitated in a way to really like um, contribute this to the expected standard or expected um, level of intelligence they have acquired. Okay, nice having you uh, again, once again. Yeah. Uh, we, have, we have taken a long, 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 long time. Yeah. Uh, I so I mean I do this the way I talk very fast. Sometimes I talk very slow. I know mm -hmm. some people may have had a bit of difficulty following my conversation, so I apologize for that. Sometimes it happens. I talk very fast. You know, I hope people are able to bear with my idiosyncrasy. No matter how a good dancer is, you must surely leave the stage. <laughs> Understand? Sure. That is it. You must surely leave the stage. Yeah. So viewers at home, um, thank you for your audience. Mm. We we'll keep on bringing a lot and a lot until we find the vaccine to this pandemic virus called poverty. Papka discovered this. So this is the pandemic that I name in Africa and in Nigeria. Unless Nigeria is going to be free, Africa cannot be free. So if Nigeria is free, then we are setting path for Africa. And I believe that in one way or the other, we are going to make Nigeria regain back its lost glory again in every sector. Understand? So um, at the moment, before I, I close it today, uh, Ms. Lupua Benjamin, what do you have for the people as I'm going to, we are closing. Okay, meeting. so I just, I just basically have one thing to say. Um, if, there's, if there's anything I have been able to see or learn from what's been happening with the COVID, with the COVID-19 um, pandemic, I think it has shown me how um, I have seen a lot of countries just um, doing all they can doing all they can to be able to, um, to protect their citizens, to be able to help preserve lives and a whole lot of other things. And, and some of these countries have been able to come up with valid solutions, okay, like the, like the vaccines, which are being distributed now, and some people are even being vaccinated and all of those things. And I, I ask myself as a Nigerian, in these times, what have we been able to offer to the world in this, in this, in this particular time where um, everybody, everybody was in this, in this problem, everybody was facing this particular problem. What have we been able to offer? I feel like I feel like in a time like this, we should be able to offer offer more. We should be able to offer also our expertise in terms of um, just helping out with the vaccines and things like that. And so I feel like this is also an aspect 
where we, we are experiencing that virus. Yeah, so I feel like this is also an aspect where we are experiencing that virus. And I hope that um, more, more people would, would start seeing this and they would start um, trying to help to change things, to make things better, to be able to bring valuable um, development, sustainable development that would help Nigeria as a nation to be able to stand and help out in times like this in the future. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Gift, yeah. what's your last message? Okay, so um, once again, thank you for having me. And um, yes, um, as she rightly said, I'll be just developing on what she said. We first need to have a change of mindsets and, and, um, and the change of mindsets most importantly needs to come from the arm of the community. And then again, because if the, obviously if the people are strong and you know united to a particular cause, then the government can really do less to sabotage them. Yeah, and then if we have that solved, then the government will be forced to do the right thing. Because that's the problem, like um, we are a little bit like um, enslaved by the leaders in a way that um, we have no right of our own. So it's not that we don't know the right thing to do. We do. It's just that um, in implementing them, we are good. We are good solution and uh, we prefer good solutions. So almost everyone is an expert in the issues and pro problems facing Nigeria. The only problem right now is the implementation. Sometimes we know these things, but taking the actions is where you know there's the issue. But again, it's, a quite, it's quite complex. It's not something that you wake up one morning and then it will be solved. It's a gradual process. And then we need to start from somewhere start by changing the mindset, prioritizing our uh, our needs and also prioritizing ways of um, um, overcoming and tackling these challenges and needs that we face or we um, have as a mission. And then um, I think in no time, if um, everyone's, you know, has this change of mindset and at the same time, we have um, this um, exposure to fully demand for what we deserve. That is demand what we deserve, I mean, and then, um, you know, hold our government accountable. Our leaders, you know, we allow, we make them, uh, we, you know, we make them fear us because we are more scared of our leaders than they are scared of us. So somehow they should be scared of the masses, not the other way around. So if we make our leaders scared enough, then they will do the right thing. They have no choice, as a matter of fact. Because at the end of their leadership, they return to the communities. They don't remain in power and lock up, even after their, um, even after their days in office, their tenants. They don't remain in the office. They come back to the community. So again, if we hold them accountable, you know, we make them fear us and respect us in the way that um, they are able to like handle our problems, you know, in the way that uh, expected as leaders. And I think um, our desired progress, you know, is not far from us at all. Yeah. So thank you once again for having me. A nice meeting, Luwapua. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, viewers at home. I was going to call it a day, as you all know that. I'll subsequently, I will be bringing different series, different episodes until we eradicate this pandemic called poverty virus in Nigeria. I remain my humble self, the one and only boy, the loyal one, Papka International, the one that have roots in Africa, branches in North and South America, Asia, okay. Australia, Antarctica, and Europe. Do well to follow me on my Twitter handle, Pius Jabla, Instagram, Pius Jabla, Facebook, Pius Jabla, for more updates, because more are coming until we have Nigeria to be great again. Thank you, everyone. All right.